I think that the public has long believed in the existence of life elsewhere. I mean, uh, I suspect that if you ask people in 1930, even in 1936, do you think that there's life in space? They would say, oh, sure. The idea that there might be life here, visiting Earth, that's much newer, and that really dates to the post-war years, when you had people seeing things in the sky that they said, I don't know what that is. It could be an alien spacecraft. And that began more or less in 1947. The same summer, by the way, of 47, when uh, the celebrated Roswell incident took place. Now, on the one hand, you can say, look, I believe the evidence for alien visitation. You know, some of these saucers are actually alien spacecraft, or I don't believe it. But in fact, the fraction of Americans that do believe it is about one third, one in three. So it's widespread and of some interest to me in particular is the fact that the people that do believe it are very hard over on that. They, they really believe it. A couple of times a year, uh, they hold something called Alien Con. I have to say, there weren't too many aliens in attendance, but there were lots of people there among the speakers who think that the aliens are, you know, for example, buzzing the countryside, that they've come to visit the Earth. The people here have uh, real curiosity. And my feeling is that it, it's incredibly arrogant for the human race to think we are the only intelligent life in the, in the universe. In the last 20 years, we went from an awareness of our solar system to over 3,000 exoplanets have been discovered. And that's probably a drop in the bucket. So I, I think that it's all fascinating stuff. But as I said, my personal belief is the first life we're gonna, we're gonna discover off world is gonna be so tiny, you can't see it with a human eye. I, I noticed that the men in black are lined up here on the front row. <laughs> About 15 years ago, we picked up a signal that seemed like the real deal. And I kept waiting for the men in black to show up, which they didn't. And I figured that was because they were on a retreat somewhere in Trenton, New Jersey. So we didn't, we didn't see them. Here is the conundrum. How do we reconcile the expectation that the galaxy is filled with aliens with the fact that we don't see them? We assume that the, the galaxy is filled with aliens, by the way. I mean, that's my job is to kind of look for them, right? And, and people will ask me all the time, oh, Seth, do you really think there are aliens out there? What are you talking about? If I didn't think that, why would I do this job? There are, you know, like 8,000 functioning satellites in orbit above your heads. And for some reason, they don't see the UFOs. And you say, well, they do see the UFOs. There's also this. I don't know how many amateur astronomers there are in the world. 500,000, maybe they only get out one hour a week because it's cloudy where they live or whatever. But that means that the amateurs are looking at the entire sky every couple of hours. If we're really being visited, they should be seeing UFOs all the time. But they don't. The SETI Institute, where I'm sitting now, uh, is interested in the whole question of life in space. A lot of people know of the idea of SETI trying to eavesdrop on radio signals, and they usually have uh, a vision in their mind of what they've seen in the movies or on TV where, you know, some scientist is wearing earphones trying to pick up the aliens that way. You know, we monitor tens of millions, billions of radio channels simultaneously. Now, our experiments today uh, are using something called the Allen Telescope Array. It's 42 antennas up in the Cascade Mountains to look at nearby star systems, hoping to pick up a signal that would tell us somebody's out there. Now, when we pick up signals here, you know, we don't convert them to audio. Nobody's listening to anything. They're just numbers. And we had the computers look at the numbers. If you actually did convert it to audio, it would be a little disappointing because mostly what you're going to hear are the receivers. You're going to hear your own instrument and it's just going to sound the same as your kitchen faucet does when you turn it on. It's just pshhh. Not really very interesting. But we're using it and we're going through the star systems, you know, as quickly as we can. New equipment would make that speed much higher and so that's why I remain confident that in the next couple of decades, we will find a signal, but I could be wrong. That's what we do. It's a, it's a technical thing 
All the listening is done by computers, which I find personally gratifying because the computers don't ask for a coffee break. SETI is the name of a field like biology or chemistry, and there are a lot of different groups. There's a group at Harvard, there's our group at Berkeley, there's a group at the SETI Institute, there are groups in Italy, Argentina, France, Japan. There are many different groups, which is a healthy thing for field. You want a lot of different ideas. Seth and I, we both look for radio signals. Our group um, also looks for laser signals, infrared signals. We, we like to try a lot of variety here at Berkeley. We have different ex students working on lots of different things. We don't know exactly what a signal from ET would look like. So we're gonna look at a lot of different channels for a lot of different signal types. And we're hoping it would stand out from a natural signal. So if you tune your radio between the channels, you can hear the stars and the galaxies and the Big Bang, but it sounds mostly like that pshh, that staticky stuff that you get on your TV between the channels. But a radio signal from another civilization might sound like a beep or a boo. That's not natural. There's no known signal that sounds like that. The facts are that nature makes a lot of radio waves, right? If you point an antenna at the, the sun, you'll hear, you know, all sorts of you know, kind of uninteresting sounds. If you point at a pulsar, they're a little more interesting. It's a completely natural thing. A pulsar is just a dead star about the size of, you know, Manhattan Island, and, but it's spinning around very rapidly. So what you hear is, Okay, for a while people thought maybe those are the aliens, but they're not, they're just dead stars, right? What would the aliens sound like? Who knows what the aliens would sound like, but the kind of signal we're listening for is just the signal that shows their transmitters turned on. And that would sound like a very faint whistle against the whoosh, the constant whoosh from your receivers. So it would be do that up against the, uh, you know, the bathtub faucet on it, and you get some idea of what the computers are looking for. What we work on is just trying to see if there's a signal out there. We don't really care what the information content is at the beginning of this thing. So the SETI at Home screensaver, if you go out and download it, anybody can download it, it's a free program. It actually is not trying to decode a message. It's just trying to say, hey, there's something interesting at this frequency, at this place in the sky, let's go look at it again. And then I think if you find something, a lot of people will be really excited. So we're trying not to make too many assumptions about, you know, alien technology. I mean, what kind of transmitters do they have? Do they use AM? Do they use FM? Pulse code modulation? Do they this, that, and the other? I mean, these are all possibilities for which we have no answers. But what you do know is that if they're making a signal that they want to be easily picked up by somebody very far away, then they will take as much of the transmitter power as they can and put it in as narrow a bit of the radio dial as they can. So it's what's called a narrow band signal. That's all we look for. We're not looking for the value of pi. We're not looking for the Fibonacci series. We're not prime numbers, any of that stuff. Great for the movies, but that's not what we do. I think we'd be very lucky to find these civilizations if they're out there right now. I'm optimistic though, because the technology is changing so fast. Uh, it's grown by a factor of a billion. We listen to more channels, better telescopes, cover more of the sky. But I bet we need another factor of a billion before we have a good chance of finding these signals if they're out there. But if that technology trend keeps going, that exponential growth, that's another 40 years. So this could happen in our lifetimes. I mean, everybody wants to know, is there anybody out there or not? I mean, if you were to find out that there is somebody out there, that would be really, really, not only interesting, but for forever thereafter. Humans would know, yeah, well, we're just another you know, kid on the block. So I think that that's part of the attraction, that finally humans have gotten to the point in their knowledge of science and technology where they could find the ETs, and uh, why not try? If you told Christopher Columbus 500 years ago, you're wasting your time with these ships to go find spices in India, just wait 500 years, you'll have airplanes, make your job, but Columbus found something interesting. So maybe we will as well. <laughs>